tonight we are very, very fortunate. And the fact that there's not one seat left in the House speaks to the fact that you all are aware that we're fortunate to have uh, Dr. Ibn Alexander with us here to share with us some of his uh, experience, uh, which is very important because he's not just sharing with us ideas and thoughts and concepts, but an actual experience that has influenced him and has gone on to influence Ripple throughout the world. Uh, as you all know, Dr. Alexander had an experience, near-death experience, an out-of-body experience during which he was able to perceive certain things about the nature of the afterlife and its relationship to this world we live in now. Uh, it's quite interesting. He wrote a book about that. This book is something that has touched a nerve in people, not just in the United States, but around the world. The very first week that the book came onto the bookshelves, it went to the number one best-selling book in the New York Times bestseller list and has remained there consistently ever since. And this is 2012 we're talking about. So it's something that speaks to an awful lot of people. It is now translated into 43 different languages. So just in case you thought that this is an American phenomenon of awakening, it is not. So rather than uh, talk any more about those sorts of things, I think it would be best for me to turn it over to the man himself, and he can do a much better job. So please, if you welcome Dr. Evan Alexander. Thank you. Thank you all. It's a real joy to be here tonight. Um, this, uh, this part of the country I've been to several times to give uh, talks on my experience and uh, always find that there is a very uh, open world here uh, in the Chicago area. And uh, I've been up to Minneapolis and other places in, in this region. And it's very heartwarming to me how awake this part of the world really is. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful gift to be here. I think uh, what I'll be getting into tonight, uh, the good news is we have uh, some real time. Some people try and com compactify my uh, talk into an hour or so, and tonight we have a little more time than that, which is really good. And then uh, we're hoping to uh, have about a half hour or so for some question and answers, because as you can imagine, I don't usually come up with all the answers in my talk. Uh, although I've been giving talks on this now for uh, probably about five years, four, four years or so. And so I've come to anticipate a lot of the questions, but that usually just means we get better questions. So I'm sure we'll get some tonight. Uh, I think to, to properly get into this, I do need to see a show of hands. How many have not read the book Proof of Heaven? You won't be graded on this, but just a little show of hands. Okay. Uh, so probably about half the audience or so. Well, a uh, little spoiler alert. I'm going to get into some things tonight that I, I think uh, have a lot to do with why the book has had the impact it's had. But on the other hand, I'm also going to take you a lot deeper into some of the concepts uh, because there's so much more to it than is there in the book Proof of Heaven. And that is something that I think a lot of people uh, who've read it, especially uh, spiritual journeyers, realize there's so much more to this story. Turns out when I, when I took the original manuscript, uh, to New York, uh, and this, this was something that didn't, had not started out as a book for the general public. Uh, in fact, when I first came back from my coma, for one thing, my, my brain was devastated, uh, and I'll get into that in some detail. I think that's an important feature because people have a way of looking at me up here and saying, well, he can't have been that sick, uh, but the doctors who hear the story, and certainly my doctors to this day, have no idea how I came back. I have no idea how I came back, and yet I can tell you that there's some lessons in there that are uh, beautiful lessons for all of us, because the power is there for all of us to awaken as eternal spiritual beings and come to realize much more what this is all about. And the uh, beautiful gift that that brings with it is a tremendous capability for healing in every sense of the word. And I'll be getting into that, of those who've read the book, uh, we'll know uh, 
I get into a deep discussion there about unconditional love and, and what it really is all about and what it means. And certainly, I'm sure there are many in this room who have been there. That was one of the things that really shocked me uh, when I came back, because uh, before I started on all of this, uh, I had grown up pretty much uh, in the scientific culture of the 20th century, uh, what's called reductive materialism. And uh, I was a card-toting member of that reductive materialist uh, scientific community. That's kind of the conventional wisdom that's out there um, in science. And yet I will tell you there are a lot of scientists around the world uh, who realize that when you start getting into the mystery of consciousness, uh, which in essence is the only thing any one of us truly knows exists, is our own consciousness. And, and trying to um, see exactly what consciousness is, and I'm going to talk about this uh, quite a bit more in a while, um, but in fact, uh, asking any one of us about that consciousness is kind of like asking a fish what it's like in the water. You know, we're so close to it, there's no way to really separate out, and, and uh, I assure you that the only thing you've ever really known is your own consciousness. And we believe that there's this external world out there, the material realm, you know, and that's the realm that that uh, materialist science will try and sell, tell you is the thing that exists. But it's uh, really right at the heart of the, the deep enigma of quantum mechanics that our modern science has wrestled with for more than a century now trying to understand. And basically what the results of those experiments have been screaming for our attention is that consciousness is primary and fundamental in the existence of this universe. And that is a very important thing to understand. And it also has to do with the whole question of the relationship of the brain and, and the mind, the mind-body discussion, uh, which is uh, basically a discussion that's been going on for more than 2,600 years. You'd think we'd be getting a little closer to an answer. Well, in fact, I think we are getting closer. But one thing my journey showed me very, very clearly is human brain and mind will never have a complete understanding of the workings of that creator and of this universe. And uh, one of the points I make in the book Proof of Heaven is that uh, we are probably better off than, say, a chimpanzee when it comes to trying to come up with a theory of everything, but not that much. That's an important thing to remember. But that doesn't get away from the point that by being conscious beings, we have access to far grander knowledge than I ever could have imagined before. And that's because we have access to infinite underlying universal consciousness, which is something we can get to through deep prayer, uh, meditation, many different ways to get there. And, and that's something else that I'll get into in detail. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, because what I really want to do is take you back and give you a little better picture of who I was before. Because I think that the, the arc of my life and of my story uh, in many ways kind of mirrors what all of humanity is going through. And in fact has been going through for many thousands of years. And uh, I, as I said earlier, I, I, I grew up in a, in a very scientific home. Um, in fact, my, my father, who was very influential in my life, uh, he, had been, uh, he had grown up in eastern Tennessee. His own father was a general surgeon. My father grew up in the Depression. He was a combat surgeon in the Pacific in the Second World War. And I assure you, his very strong faith in an infinitely powerful and loving God got him through the brutality and hardship that he saw in New Guinea and the Philippines and then on up into Japan in the mid-1940s. That faith in God got him through that and he came back and headed up a neurosurgical training program in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He was a world-renowned neurosurgeon. So he was very much a scientist. Now for him, there was never any conflict. He knew that the science that he studied so hard didn't hold a candle to the power, wisdom, and love of that God at the core of, of his, his beliefs and the nature of this world. 
And uh, so for him, it was always very simple. You know, science was, was very small and the human brain and mind very small and would never remotely come in the ballpark of being able to prove or disprove the existence of that infinitely loving God. Now, I'm pretty much a child of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And uh, like many in this room who are of my generation, I grew up knowing that science is the pathway to truth. Now, I'm more of a scientist now than I've ever been. And I also realize that the science that I worshipped before my coma and I promise you that that pure materialist science, reductive materialism, that in a nutshell says, if you reduce everything down to electrons, protons, quarks, neutrons, photons, subatomic particles, build up the physics, chemistry, biology, uh, the brain, and all of that, you can understand everything there is to understand about the workings of the universe. And the problem with that kind of thinking, the way it stands now, is that that science cannot offer up the first sentence to try and explain to you how the physical brain might give rise to consciousness. That is something I believed and accepted, hook, line, and sinker, because I worship that science. And what I'll tell you is that pure materialism in science, you know, just the physics, chemistry, biology, that is so woefully inadequate, it, even the first sentence to explain consciousness, that very same conventional science, which still holds the bully pulpit in this world, front page of the New York Times and all of that, um, in many ways is on the way out. This is all about a far deeper understanding of who we are and a great gift to science. This is all about science and spirituality converging. They're far more powerful together. And as much as one would like to think that science is a search for truth, you have to remember there's kind of an unwritten rule in science, and that is that you cannot invoke any kind of God, any kind of superior intelligence that might be at the core of all that's, that's, that's happening in this universe. And uh, in fact, that's their blind spot. It's very much their blind spot. And that's one of the reasons why they've been struggling and wrestling for more than a century to try and explain the results of experiments in the most proven theory in all of the history of science. And that has to do with quantum mechanics. And I'll talk a bit more about why that's important in a little while. I know some people, when they hear quantum mechanics, they really just want to turn and go the other way. Uh, you don't have to know anything about the math or physics to understand what's going on here. All you have to realize is that the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, very brilliant physicists like Niels Bohr and, and uh, Erwin Schrodinger, uh, Werner Heisenberg, Paul Dirac, Louis de Broglie, even Albert Einstein, although he was dragged kicking and screaming to the end about the phenomenon of entanglement, which he called spooky action at a distance, really kind of haunted him. But I promise you, back in April 1955, he got a real glimpse of how it all works and what it means. And uh, I will get into that. But the, the other thing to understand about that reductive materialist science that says the brain creates consciousness, it says it's all birth to death and nothing more, it basically also says that we're all automatons. That modern neuroscience will tell you none of us have free will. In fact, they will try and tell you that consciousness itself is a complete illusion. In other words, that it's just those subatomic particles, atoms, molecules in the brain, the cells in the brain, creating this illusion of consciousness, but no, they're just following natural laws. That kind of science is a faith-based religion that actually has almost nothing to support it. And what I mean by that is that spirit, soul, consciousness is the fundamental reality of existence in this universe. And the brain does not create consciousness as much as serve as a reducing valve or filter that allows consciousness in. And as a neurosurgeon who spent uh, more than 15 years at Harvard Medical School and really bought into the conventional model of brain creates consciousness, that's a pretty big admission about uh, changing up my worldview. Uh, so what I'd like to do is kind of take you back and take you through my personal story and how I was able to arrive at uh, 
where I am now. And, and I promise you, this is very much an ongoing journey. I'm on a vertical part of the learning curve. I feel very much like a kid in a candy store. I mean, this is absolutely astonishing and amazing, but it's really about this whole world waking up to a much deeper truth. And one reason I'm especially glad to be here tonight is because the Theosophical Society is something I promise you I'd never heard anything about before my coma. But I came to realize uh, in the years after my coma, as I got deeper and deeper into trying to understand this, that there are many in this world who have known so much of these truths for a very long time. In fact, this is really about a convergence of human knowledge uh, that uh, will lead into the most amazing and unimaginable future for all of humanity. And it's that convergence of science and spirituality that I talked about, but it has everything to do with understanding that so much of the confusion in this world and of the actual conflict, warfare, and antagonism has to do with a misinterpretation of the writings of religious mystics and prophets and how that's all been used to uh, separate us in many ways. And yet, the message of the Theosophical Society and certainly a message I came to through my experience has to do with the fact that we are all truly one. And this is not just about humans. In fact, it's not just about life on Earth. It's far bigger than that. And it has to do with the course of human destiny over the last several thousand years. It all makes sense when you step back and take a broader, much broader view of where it's headed. And I promise you, one can be very optimistic about where that's going. Now, I want to take you back uh, five and a half years or so, um, at which time I had spent more than 20 years in academic neurosurgery, thought I had some idea of how the brain, mind, and consciousness worked. And again, I was totally into that conventional neuroscientific view that is about to disappear from this world because it's inadequate. It's far too simple. And it doesn't explain any of the observations. Now, on uh, the morning of November 10th, 2008, at 4.30, I woke up with severe back pain. This was totally out of the blue. Uh, and this, of course, is a, lo a lot of the story proof of heaven, but um, I don't want to repeat a lot of that, but there are a few essential parts that I want to bring out. And, uh, I remember thinking that if I could uh, make it down the hallway in my home and get into a hot bath, maybe the, the pain would go away. Well, in fact, uh, I got into a hot bath and almost couldn't get out of the tub. The pain kept getting worse and worse. I was able to pull myself up on a towel and then took little baby steps down the hall back into the bedroom and I collapsed, writhing in agony, in a cold sweat, collapsed on the bed, and just in abject misery, couldn't figure out what in the world was going on, the pain getting worse and worse by the minute. Soon thereafter, my youngest son, uh, at that time he was 10 years old, his name is Bond. Those who've read the book will realize that Bond is a far more appropriate name for him than I knew at the time. But Bond came in the room and realized, uh, Dad's not off at work, and my God, he looks like he's in horrible pain. So he came over and he started rubbing my temples to make me feel better. As soon as he touched my head, I felt like he'd driven a white hot railroad spike right through my head, severe pain. And of course, anyone out there with any kind of medical background, if you heard about sudden onset of severe back pain, severe headache, you might think meningitis. Well, the doctor was already out. My brain was being overrun with an extremely rare, aggressive, primitive, and absolutely should have killed me bacterial infection, a meningoencephalitis, and I had no clue what was unfolding. And in the midst of this worsening torture of pain, you might wonder what in the world was going through my mind. Well, I remember uh, Bond was being readied for school downstairs, and I'm lying there in this worsening pain thinking, oh my gosh, if this really gets bad, I might have to go to the emergency room. 
And if that happens, well, I could imagine the, all the lines and waiting and the paperwork, and then finally I'd, I'd start getting better on my own, and there'd be all the embarrassing goodbyes to my colleagues. And so I remember thinking that it might take so long that I wouldn't even be home by the time he got back from school. So I remember kind of croaking out, have a good day at school, Bond. It's the last thing I remember. I was gone from this world for the next seven days don't remember a thing. My family actually thought I was resting, so they closed the door and let that happen. And about two hours later, when they came in to check on me, I was having a grand mal epileptic seizure. So yes, they called 911, and the EMTs came to our, our home, and they came in, started some IVs, put in uh, medications trying to break the seizures, and couldn't do it. So they hauled me off to the Lynchburg General Hospital emergency room. Of course, I remember none of this. I remember absolutely zero of the next seven days from this earthly realm. And um, when I arrived in the emergency room seizing, uh, I was very fortunate to encounter Dr. Laura Potter. I had worked side by side with uh, Dr. Potter for more than two years because I worked in that emergency room as a neurosurgeon. And uh, she didn't even recognize me. All she saw was 54-year-old white male, status epilepticus, in extremis, trying to die on her watch. She knew I was so sick that if she didn't do things very correctly from then on, I might not even get out of her emergency room alive. Now, it turns out that one of the reasons that I, I'm, I'm here today, there are many reasons, but one of them has to do with the fact that my older son, Evan IV, had been trying to get me in shape. He had climbed a 20,000-foot volcano in South America a few months before my coma, and he wanted to take me down there to climb it, so he'd been trying to get me in shape. No mean feat, I assure you. And um, we'd been working out a lot. And that, I'm convinced, was a big reason why I'm still here today to tell the tale. Uh, that's very good news for me. It was certainly not very good news for the six people who had to hold me down in the emergency room for that lumbar puncture. Because Laura Potter was intermittently able to break the seizure somewhat, uh, but then they were trying to get me in position and trying to give me sedation, trying to get me intubated, all these various things, trying to do a lumbar puncture. And when she did get that needle in my back with those people holding me down, what came out was thick white pus under pressure. And that's the fluid that was bathing my brain and spinal cord. And she told me much later when she saw that, she knew I was dead. And the reason is she very quickly got a report back from the lab that uh, I had gram-negative bacterial meningitis. And that fact, combined with the fact that I had gone into coma uh, in less than 24 hours, in fact, I had taken about three and a half hours to go into coma, uh, and those two facts alone give you a 10% chance of survival from that illness, 10% or less. So that was the rosy prognosis Monday morning, the first day of coma and it only got worse. They put me on three very powerful intravenous antibiotics, put me on a ventilator, up on the medical intensive care unit. On the second day, they found out that it was E. coli. Now, if you do a medical literature search on spontaneous E. Uh, e. coli meningitis in adults, somewhere around one in 10 million or less per year. It's extremely rare, spontaneous E. coli meningitis does occur in newborns, but it's very rare beyond the age of three months. You can imagine how I have to defend my level of maturity, but that's just something I have to live with. <laughs> and it turns out that uh, through that week, uh, the doctors had seen the last evidence of my, uh, the human part of my brain, the neocortex, uh, the outer surface of the brain. That's the part that's very specifically attacked by uh, anytime you get a meningoencephalitis. And in fact, that's, it's really that diagnosis is, that's the big gift here. And it's the reason the medical community and scientific community has taken my story so seriously. And you'll hear how the logic of that unfolds. I am often asked to give talks to medical groups, uh, nursing schools, med schools, surgical groups, etc., cetera, uh, because they get where this is all really going. Now, I do have to give credit out there. Uh, the nurses have always understood okay? ER nurses, hospice nurses, ICU nurses, they see things when patients leave this world that have no explanation if you buy into that simplistic 
birth to death and nothing more, you know, the brain creates consciousness. So the nurses have always gotten it. I can only speak for myself. Some of us doctors are a little slow on the uptake. I needed a big thumping to get it. But my hat goes off to the nurses in the audience because they've always gotten this and, and continue to. Uh, I, I'm very grateful to the nurses that got me through this whole ordeal, not to mention uh, my family. Uh, they, were, they were the ones who were always there for us, so I have tremendous gratitude to the, to the nursing community. Um, but it got worse because my doctors only saw uh, evidence that that neocortex of mine had a small remnant of abnormal function within an hour or two of hitting the emergency room. And after that, there was nothing left of that neocortex. Now, it turns out that my brain stem was also quite heavily damaged, even at the beginning. This is a very severe, meningo and severe meningoencephalitis, and it really is that diagnosis that is so important in, to the medical community, certainly in the scientific world, about understanding what happened to me and what the ramifications of that are. Um, it turns out that uh, through that week, they had several scans. Um, in fact, what happened is on the third day, putting all the pieces together, trying to understand how in the world I'd come down with uh, e. coli meningitis, my doctors uh, actually had some very frightening uh, set of circumstances unfold once they knew it was E. coli. And, and this is something I explain in a little more detail in Proof of Heaven, uh, but I just want to bring it up here briefly. It has to do with part of my medical history at that time is that a few months before my coma, uh, as part of my work, uh, before my coma I was working for the Focused Ultrasound Surgery Foundation coordinating global research in this very promising technology, something called focused ultrasound, uh, that I think is really going to revolutionize many uh, uh, parts of medicine. And uh, part of that work involved uh, going to various companies and laboratories that were doing the research work. Turns out one of those was in, uh, in Israel, in Haifa. So I'd been over there a few months before my coma. And what I remember about that trip is I arrived in uh, Tel Aviv at about 3.15 in the morning and I uh, got a cab, taxi, that took me from Tel Aviv uh, into uh, the hotel I was staying in just outside of Old Jerusalem. Now, it turns out my cab driver was new to that area and, in fact, did not speak a language spoken by anyone within 2,000 miles, as far as I could tell. And uh, so he was driving around a little lost, a little confused, and uh, in that pre-dawn darkness, so there would be cars parked around old Jerusalem out on the corner, and people were sitting in those cars, and he would go bang on the window, and then they jabbered each other in different languages. And, and finally, I remembered I'd just gotten an iPhone uh, back then. This is uh, in uh, mid-2008. And I remember it had a mapping function on it. I remember putting in the address of my hotel outside old Jerusalem, and hit the you know, search button and then showed it to him in this big toothy smile, but he still wasn't quite able to get me there. So he actually set me loose, wandering the streets of old Jerusalem to find my hotel on my own. And it was strangely powerful for me. Now, there are parts of my story I will get into, but I, as much as I had grown up in a kind of a religious home in a Methodist church, wanted to believe in that God and power of prayer, uh, through those 20 years plus in neurosurgery, um, there had been uh, more and more difficulty with me to understand how consciousness could survive death of the brain and body. And in fact, I had, uh, uh, I had a decline in my faith over that period of time just because I just didn't understand how our soul could survive the death of the brain and body. And that was punctuated in the year 2000 uh, because I had a particular uh, event in my life that had to do with a, a fundamental feature of my um, of my upbringing uh, that I'll get into later on in this story, but suffice it to say for now that what happened to me in 2000 ended up putting me squarely into a very agnostic category. So I spent eight years of my life very agnostic uh, before my coma. And that's why it was strange that in this trip to Israel, wandering around the streets of old Jerusalem in the pre-dawn with the birds singing and the twilight coming up in the east, I, I stumbled on the Via Dolorosa and was amazingly moved by the power of that walk in trying to find my hotel. And that was the part that I told my family about when I came back. That's not the part that got my doctor's attention. What got their attention 
was they knew, uh, as they were questioning my uh, family about my medical history in the first two days after I got at the hospital, that while I was in Israel, the worst case scenario, that giant nightmare for doctors, infectious disease specialists around the world, had occurred in the Tel Aviv hospital. And it has to do with something called the Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase, or KPC gene, that had first surfaced in a bacterium in 1996 in North Carolina, killed that patient, uh, but it was carefully isolated. The problem with it is that that gene confers complete antibiotic resistance on the host bacterium. And that gene surfaced again in New York in 2000, in Paris in 2001, each time killed the patient, was carefully isolated in a hospital setting, did not get out, but the word was out there among uh, physicians and uh, uh, all those who take care of infectious disease that this gene was very, very deadly. And potentially, uh, the thinking was if it ever moved into um, a bacterium in a patient that was a ubiquitous bacterium, like E. coli, and got out in this world, it could create a situation that would make the Black Plague look like a picnic because it would be so devastating, completely unresponsive to any known antibiotics, and it takes more than 10 years to develop new antibiotics. So um, that would be a, just a horrific situation. The problem is that very event had happened in that Tel Aviv hospital right around the time I was there. And so the concern was that maybe I had brought that back because what my doctors knew is that that KPC gene had surfaced in Tel Aviv and for the first time in history had migrated into a patient's other uh, organisms because those bacteria are very prolific. They can trade genetic material between species. And in that case in Tel Aviv, it migrated into an E. coli. And thank God they were able to contain that. Uh, that patient died but they were worried that I might have brought that back to the US. And you can bet that had them very, very frightened. Now, as, as the week went on and I did not respond to antibiotics, that was their big concern. Now, it turns out by day seven, things were starting to turn around finally. My white blood cell count was coming down a little bit, but the problem was I had no neurologic function left at that time. They were at a point of doing brain death criteria that was the next step. And it had only gotten worse during the week, so in fact they held a conference that Sunday morning, day seven of coma. They had a conference with my family where they said, well, you know, he started this week with a 10% chance of survival. Now we're down to a 2% chance of survival. And if he's in that lucky 2%, best case scenario, that he'll spend a month or two in this hospital, then be transferred to a nursing home in a persistent vegetative state and die in coma a few months later. So the recommendation was, why don't we stop the antibiotics? And that was indeed what they did. Now, um, it turns out it was a few hours after that that I started coming back to this world. And my doctors were right. I was extremely ill from this and should not have survived at all and should not have had any experience at all, much less any memories of experience. And that's one of the reasons why my story has captivated the scientific and medical worlds by storm is because I had an unbelievably robust, hyper-real experience that I'm going to describe to you um, in some detail. And it should never have happened according to everything that we know. Now, when I did come back, my brain was wrecked. No words, no language, no recognition of any of those beings around the hospital bed. My mother, sisters, sons. Absolutely no clue what this universe was. But I knew where I'd been. I remembered completely, full well, the journey I was returning from. Even though I remembered absolutely nothing during any part of it of Eben Alexander's life before coma. No words, no language none of the religious concepts, certainly none of the knowledge of all those years spent in neurosurgery studying brain, mind, and consciousness. Every bit of that was completely deleted for this entire experience, which makes it a little bit atypical when you look at other near-death experiences. But I was amnesic for the life of Eben Alexander, and it took me many months to even begin to glimpse how and why that might have been the case. My default 
understanding early on was that, well, of course, I had this severe bacterial meningitis that destroyed the neocortex, the human part of my brain. So it made perfect sense that I didn't have any memories or knowing of my life before coma. Turns out the reasons for it go, go quite a bit deeper than that. But that was my working model for a long time, that such a severe neocortical destruction um, would erase all the memories. But it turns out that that set the stage for a very powerful journey with tremendous lessons in it. Now, what, I've, what I knew full well when I came back was the entire journey. That journey started in a place that I call the earthworm's eye view, a very primitive, coarse, unresponsive realm, uh, like being underground or in dirty jello. I remember ha ha like... Uh, this uh, sensation of lots of roots or blood vessels around me. And almost I can feel them just thinking about what it was like, and I could sense them way off into the distance. Although I had no body image at any point of this journey, I was just a piece of awareness experiencing all this. But in that coarse, horrible, ugly underground realm that was completely unresponsive, even though I had no words, no language, I could still wonder, you know, what, where? but never a flicker of response to that curiosity. Now, many, when I would give these talks early on, they would say, well, was that earthworm's eye view, which is what I call that ugly underground realm where everything began, was that hell or purgatory? I would think hell would be at least a little bit interactive. And this was none of that. That curiosity was never answered with any flicker of anything. And looking back on it, I think that that very coarse, primitive, murky existence was the very best consciousness my physical brain could muster when it was soaking in pus and being destroyed by this primitive E. coli infection. Now, it, it turns out that if you would ask me before my coma, well, if that's your, that primitive earthworm I view is what your brain is mustering right now with this devastating infection as it progresses, and, and melts the outer surface, the human part of your brain, what's the next step? I would have told you, well, obviously, the next step is a state of no awareness at all. That is the biggest shock of the journey, is that, in fact, as this all progressed, and it did seem that that earthworm eye view went on for eons, because I promise you, I had no memory moment to moment of time. I had absolutely zero memory of my life before coma, not a tiniest bit. And so it did seem to go on for a very long time. The good news, it, it did not last forever. And what happened next was this slowly spinning white light that came towards me, a very clear and pure light that had fine white and gold tendrils off of it. And this white light came towards me. And the best part about it is it came packaged with a perfect musical melody. And it turns out that I had been aware of sound in that earthworm eye view, that very primitive existence. The sound was a pounding, monotonous sound, like someone smashing on an anvil over and over again. Just a steady rhythm. And uh, it was a very cursing sound. And yet, as this pure white light came towards me, it was coming with this perfect musical melody, absolutely beautiful. And as you will hear, Sound, music, vibration, frequency is the way that our souls transcend in these levels. It's one of the reasons why sound, hymns, chants have been used for thousands of years to help engender deep transcendental conscious states uh, in any kind of spiritual uh, broadening of consciousness, religious ceremony, etc. And that sound is absolutely essential to the work I do now. I'll talk more about that in, in a few minutes. But um, that melody, came, spinning melody, as I called it, came towards me. And it opened up like a rip in that ugly earthworm eye view. And it was a rip that opened up into this brilliant, ultra-real valley. And I remember ascending up into this valley, up into this brilliant greenery, lush with life, absolutely fertile. And I had no body awareness, but I was moving up through it because I was a speck on a butterfly wing. Now, this was not a butterfly like some entomologist here on Earth can give you genus and species. This was the real deal. And butterflies in that realm, just like 
we often have dragonflies, butterflies, and hummingbirds that are messengers from that realm, from souls of the departed loved ones. And there are thousands of stories out there. I'm sure there's some in this room about that very phenomenon. But in that realm, butterflies are far more powerful and amazing than they are in this realm. And I was a speck of awareness, and it turns out on this wing of this butterfly, um, this was one of millions of butterflies, and they were looping and swirling in this beautiful river of love and color and life beyond description. And I remember how we would dip down and go through that lush greenery, and there would be flowers and blossoms, buds on trees that would open up even as we flew by. I remember the rich textures and colors beyond the rainbow. And so beautiful. And in that beautiful valley, as we would come up and ascend above all that greenery, I could see that there were hundreds of souls dancing. And when I wrote it all up weeks later, as I came back to this world and was trying to record the whole experience, I described them as being dressed in peasant garb, very simple clothing, yet beautiful colors and tremendous joy and merriment. And there were lots of children playing and dogs jumping, and it was just a wonderful festival. And it was all being fueled because up above, in the velvety black skies above, were pure spiritual beings, orbs of golden light, swooping and swirling in formation, leaving sparkling golden trails, emanating these hymns, chants, anthems, powerful like a tsunami wave crescendo after crescendo after crescendo of the most beautiful music waves washing through me and that's what was fueling this incredible joy and mirth going on in this gateway valley as I came to call it now the important thing to understand is that that gateway valley was much more real than this world far sharper, crisper, and more real than this. This is very dreamlike by comparison. That was a deep, deep mystery to me for a long time, trying to understand that ultra-reality. It's very hard to put it into words. And when I would first describe that to people and talk about the ultra-reality, people would say, well, is that like high-def TV? Well, <laughs> it's a lot more than that. The way we know things there, you don't see with the eyes, you don't hear with the ears, you become others to feel the emotional power of existence. In fact, uh, often if you get into the near-death experience literature, you read a lot about uh, the tens of thousands of life reviews that people describe. You know that old saying, your life flashes before your eyes. Well, it's very true, and that's what near-death experiencers tell you, is that you go through every bit of, the, of your life, all the crucial parts that are there to teach you about the lessons of good and bad that are still residual lessons for you to learn to help you and your higher soul, and your soulmates, your soul group. And the judgment is not by any higher power, it's by our higher soul. That's what's doing the judging in that realm. And that's when we go through those life reviews, it's not some vague, sepia-tinted memory. These are sharp, clear, crisp, absolute reliving the events more powerfully than when we live through them in the earthly realm. And we have to feel the power of our decisions, the emotional impact on our fellow beings. So if we lived a life handing out pain and suffering to others, we have to feel that in that life review. But we have to feel it far more sharply than they felt it here in the material realm, which is a pale, dim reflection of that far more real and crisp world of that, that gateway realm, of the realm between lives, where we reunite with our higher souls and where we reunite with our soul mates. And in the glaring, beautiful, all-loving light of that infinitely powerful God, that is the setting in which we relive those events and then plan our next incarnations for coming back in. But it is a very crisp, ultra-reality. This is all about those lessons that we're here to learn. And the coin of that realm is love that unconditional love that goes far beyond the phrase, far beyond those words. And of course, so many who have had near-death experiences and shared death experiences and other similarly spiritually transformative experiences know exactly what that's all about, that unconditional love. And the reason it's so important for all of us to get is because we're here in soul school to learn those lessons of that love. 
And what we find is that that unconditional love has infinite power to heal. And I came from my journey to see that the hardships and difficulties in this life, and I promise you as a, as a neurosurgeon, as a doctor, that very much includes illness and injury. They are gifts. They are opportunity for growth of our souls. We are all here as members of soul groups to do this growing. And when I talk about soul mates, I'm not just talking about that love of your life. I also came to see that often those who I'd seen before my coma as my nemesis, you know, as someone who was in my way, preventing me from getting something I wanted in this life, often is a very near and dear soul mate. And I came to see the power of that love, that unconditional love to heal. It heals the individual. It heals the soul group. It heals all of humanity. It heals life all around this world. And it heals consciousness throughout this universe because there are many sentient beings in many civilizations throughout all of eternity throughout this universe. This is a much bigger party than, uh, than I might have ever thought before. And this is all part of our joining that much bigger awareness and knowing of consciousness in its grandest sense. Now, it turns out that in that beautiful gateway valley, that ultra real valley on that beautiful butterfly wing, the best part about it, I wasn't alone. There was a beautiful girl. And I promise you it doesn't get better than that. And it turns out, I'll never forget the way she was sitting, the way she was dressed, the way she looked at me. And she looked at me with this very loving smile that transcends any of our words of love and our uses of romantic love or the love of parent and child, of any of the kind of love that we have here, love for all of humanity. This is the love that transcends it all, is that unconditional love that we encounter there. People who have near-death experiences, even if all they do is touch briefly, glimpse that unconditional love, it changes their life forever. So don't let the simplicity of that phrase lead you astray. It is infinitely powerful. It's something that we all know because all of our souls have been there before and go back and we cycle through again and again in our ascent. Now, another thing that's very important to understand is that time flow in that gateway realm is very different from time flow here. That's one of the reasons why those life reviews, the memories are not just vague memories, but very strong, powerful learning opportunities where the goods and bads of our life and what we've done to others, feeling the impact of our decisions on others is so hyper real. And we go through it like they say, you know, flash this before your eyes. And the amazing thing is it doesn't take anything of earth time. It could happen in a second or it could take a century to unfold. It doesn't matter. Because time flow and causality in that realm is a much higher order than in this realm. And that's why often when I talk about reincarnation, some people get a little worried and say, well, wait a minute, what if the love of my life gets tired of waiting for me and they reincarnate before I get there? I promise you that doesn't happen. Because this is really all about love. And it's all about the relationships that we have. This is all about learning in soul school and growing as we do. And there's nothing more complex than knowing that it's simply by following a pathway that is one of manifesting that love as best we can. Love is the coin of that realm. And the more we can serve as conduits of that love, because our very consciousness is a direct, absolute connection to the divine, infinite healing power of that all-loving source. And by serving as conduits for that, and allowing the love to come through us to our fellow beings to show compassion, forgiveness, mercy, acceptance. That's all that matters. And that's what these lessons are all about. And that's how our souls ascend, is by getting closer and closer to that perfection of that love and ascending towards that oneness with the divine. Now, it turns out that this beautiful girl on the butterfly wing, as I said, she never said a word. She didn't have to. Her thoughts came straight into my awareness. Now, of course, I had no words or language, so it was pure conceptual flow. But when I wrote it all up a few weeks later, when I came back to this world, I put those thoughts down that had come to me directly from her with that all-loving smile. And this is, in my view, the central message of proof of heaven. You are deeply loved 
and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You will be taken care of. And nothing to fear is very, very critical. Because I saw very much, in my view, how this was not a battle between good and evil, between light and darkness. In fact, there's plenty of evil and darkness in this world. But it's not a force that is against love and light of that infinitely powerful creator. We simply serve as channels to bring that love and light into this world. And it displaces the darkness and evil. The darkness and evil are plenty real in this material realm. And you can also encounter them in those lower spiritual realms, such as I did in that earthworm eye view. The important thing to remember is when you know and fully know that you are a divine, eternal, spiritual being directly connected to that all-powerful creative deity, you have nothing to fear. And that is all you need to know. When you believe that and know that, it enables you to bring that lightness and love into this world in the face of darkness and evil as we perceive it here, and to do so in those spiritual realms and ascend higher and higher towards that oneness with the divine, with the soul group, and, and all that our souls are doing to, to ascend to those levels. Now, it turns out that there was another a message that she gave me in addition to these messages of unconditional love. And this is one, in retrospect, I wish I had embellished on a little more in the book. You can do no wrong. And of course, I, I get in a little bit of hot water over that one when people just get to the book and read that far and they go, wait a minute, we can do wrong down here. Well, the reality is she meant it. You can do no wrong as long as we realize that we reap what we sow. If we hand out pain and suffering to others as part of the lessons we're trying to learn, we're going to end up either making amends in this incarnation or having to live through the pain and suffering on their behalf in that life review. There is no need for an eternal hell. And in fact, that life review provides plenty of impetus for us to learn the lessons of that love and then plan that next incarnation with our soulmates and come back in here. But you can do no wrong knowing full well that we are here to learn and teach those lessons with our soulmates. And again, the lessons have everything to do with that love, have to do with knowing that we are eternal spiritual beings through multiple incarnations. And for those of you who uh, grew up like I did in a Christian faith, I promise you there's a tremendous amount in original Christianity that fully supports reincarnation. And I, believing as I did before my coma that brain creates consciousness, I'd never paid any attention to the near-death experience literature. I also did not realize that there's a very strong scientific literature on past life memories in children. In fact, the uh, uh, arch skeptic and scientist Carl Sagan admitted that one, one of the features of uh, what he called psi or paranormal phenomena that had way too much evidence and demanded a much deeper explanation was past life memories in children and the evidence that it brings for reincarnation. A lot of that work has been done by the group at University of Virginia um, and uh, Karen Newell and I work a lot with, with, uh, with that group now and some of the work we do with sacred acoustics but it turns out that um, the work of Ian Stevenson and more recently of Jim Tucker about past life memories in children fully brings out the reality of that. That reincarnation is real. Then you have to go and explain, well, how in the world does that happen? It clearly defies that simplistic kindergarten level thinking of brain creates consciousness. So you can bet there's some major pushback from uh, uh, neuroscientists who are materialists in their beliefs. But in fact, it's very real. And um, this is a, a big part of understanding. It's also very consistent, as I said, with, uh, with early Christianity, with the original teachings, especially if you start to get into the Gnostic Gospels. Uh, and there are also reasons why, uh, even though it is mentioned that, uh, that John the Baptist was a reincarnation of Elijah the prophet, um, it has not been brought out as much in the, in the New Testament, but in some of the other um, Gnostic Gospels and other early sources. It's a very uh, profound reality. And th yet there are reasons why that whole concept of reincarnation was kind of squashed by the Council of Nicaea and by others who were trying to control people's minds over the millennia. 
Now, it turns out that on that beautiful butterfly wing with this lovely girl, there was yet more to come, and that had to do with those angelic choirs above. I've told you, music, sound, vibration, frequency, uh, that's what allows our souls to ascend and transcend to higher and higher levels in those spiritual realms. And what I remember is all of that collapsing down. The material world, this four-dimensional space-time collapsing down. That deeper time of causality uh, in that gateway, that uh, beautiful galley, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the gateway valley, uh, where we often are between lives, collapsing down, that higher causality, all of that collapsing down until I finally emerged into this uh, realm that I call the core, infinite inky blackness filled to overflowing with infinite unconditional love of that creator all through eternity and infinity and higher dimensional space. And in that beautiful, all-powerful, infinite love, there was also this brilliant orb of light, brighter than a million stars, that I remember being there and I thought that it was somehow serving as an interpreter or translator. A very strong sense of the three of us being there, of that infinite, all-loving, creative power far beyond any naming, far beyond any description. And yes, that deity has no gender. Oprah asked that question, just in case that one's out there. No, that deity has no gender, is completely beyond any words or description. And that's why I think that, that orb of light was there. Now, all of what I'd seen collapsing down, higher dimensional space time, those spiritual realms, every bit of that was like this very complex oversphere that was there as part of the lessons. And when I entered that core realm, I was told, now not in words, this is pure conceptual flow, you're not here to stay. We'll teach you many things. You'll be going back. And I hope you understand by now that when I say the three of us, you know, this infinite, all-powerful, creative source and, and uh, that orb of light and my conscious awareness, this was consciousness far beyond the limited consciousness of Eben Alexander. This was the consciousness we all share, far deeper, far more profound, a direct link to divine, which is in each and every one of us. And you don't have to have a near-death experience to come to know this. Deep meditation and centering prayer, um, that's why I do so much of the work with sacred acoustics, is to help take that to the next level and help people to meditate in a much deeper fashion because that is how we can come to know these much deeper truths. Now. It turns out that in the midst of so many lessons there in that core realm, I would then inexplicably pop back into that earthworm eye view. That was a real shocker. How in the world did that happen? I'd go right back to square one, to that very primitive, ugly underground with the roots and blood vessels around me. But I very quickly came to realize that by remembering the musical notes of the melody, and I would go through those notes in my mind and go through them like, like like a chant, and by going through those musical notes, that spinning white light would come back and would come towards me and would open again like a rip in that fabric, and I'd re-enter that beautiful gateway valley on the butterfly wing with that lovely girl and all the souls dancing below, all the joy and merriment, and the same reassurance of unconditional love from her every time. And then those beautiful swooping orbs of light above, which I came to call in my writings angelic choirs, it was clear that's exactly what they were. And yet, once again, that music from those swooping orbs would generate this portal, and I would go swirling on up through higher and higher as all this collapsed down, back into that core realm, always assured you're not here to stay. You'll be going back, but we'll teach you many things. And I cycled through several times. I don't know how many. But then there came a time, I, I'd even come to believe that back, was back to the earthworm eye view. So, no worry. I knew that all I had to do was remember the notes of the spinning melody. And that was my ticket back up into that beautiful ultra-real gateway valley, and then through the angelic choirs to higher and higher realms and back into the core. But as you can imagine, they weren't kidding. And so there came a time when the notes of the melody no longer worked. I could no longer conjure up that beautiful spinning pure light that had been my gateway, my portal, up into that gateway realm. And to say I was sad is an understatement. Because, in fact, when those gates to heaven were closed, 
sadness there, emotions are extremely powerful in that realm. To imagine monsoon rains throughout all of eternity, you can begin to touch on it. But in fact, I also knew by that point that I could trust I would be taken care of, that I could do nothing wrong, that I was infinitely loved by that all-powerful deity beyond all description. And in that core realm, I remember the one thing I brought back that I could really bring back to this world was the sound that I heard there. I've told you how sound and vibration are so important in all of this. Well, in that core realm with that infinite inky blackness, that all-loving, all-powerful deity beyond any naming, I heard that sound of Aum, that eternal resonance of all of infinity and eternity. That deep Aum sound was what I called that deity when I came back. Because to me, when I was writing this all up a few weeks after my coma, the word God was way too puny a little human word. And I realized that that deity was far beyond any kind of naming or description. That's why, for me, the word Aum had no baggage at all. I'd never heard of its use as a mantra in, in some of the Eastern meditative traditions and that kind of thing. So Aum is what I call that deity. Aum made perfect sense to me. It was only much later that I came to realize, people alerted me, that Aum actually was a sound that uh, had a lot to do with other religious and spiritual traditions. Now, uh, in this, uh, when I was locked out, when I found that the melody, the remembering the notes of the melody no longer worked to get me into that beautiful idyllic realm. As I said, I was very sad, but I knew I could trust I would be taken care of. And I remember at that point seeing thousands of beings around me in this very kind of misty, murky existence going all around me, these beings. And they were all kneeling, some with hoods, many with candles. And there was this murmuring energy coming up from them. And the thing that was so shocking is that murmuring energy brought the very same all-loving feeling that I'd come to know in the gateway realm and in the core with that unconditional love of the Creator. And I remember how comforting that was and, and all these beings going off around me. And, and I remember when I wrote all that up a few weeks later, I said what those beings were doing was praying. That's what I was feeling was the power of that prayer and how prayer can actually bring the power of that realm right into this realm and can help in our healing especially when we come to realize that we are eternal spiritual beings. And if we can learn the lessons that the illness or injury is here to teach us, that sometimes there's a way that we are meant to recover from that illness. And that is, of course, the deeper lesson of my healing because I spent several years completely mystified. My doctors to this day will tell you they have no explanation whatsoever for how I had a complete recovery within about three months when they were basically certain I had no chance of recovery at all other than surviving for a few months and then dying. And uh, for those who, uh, who want to hear more about that, I, I often steer people to that beautiful book that helped me to start glimpsing uh, how this healing can happen. Uh, it's a book by Anita Morjani. It's called Dying to Be Me. A very powerful book, and she had a stage 4B non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and by all accounts should have been dead within hours of hitting an emergency room in Hong Kong uh, back in 2006. And yet uh, she had a profound near-death experience, and when she made a decision to come back, she knew that her cancer would disappear, and that's exactly what happened. And uh, it was reading her book that I first started to glimpse some of what is at the core of the lesson here about healing and how we can, we can sometimes manifest physical healing in this incarnation. Um, so it turns out, though, that in that realm, all these beings around me, uh, I saw the power of that prayer. I could feel the love and energy of that and how that was coming to comfort my return. And I didn't know where I was returning to. Now, I then saw six faces. And the six faces are very important. They would kind of bubble up out of the muck around me. And they would say some words. And then they would disappear again. Now, I didn't understand any of the words. Um, my, my brain was very wrecked. And uh, 
I, I just uh, didn't understand. It was a lot like uh, if you've seen uh, Charlie Brown's Christmas story when the adults talk, wah, 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 wah. It was the same kind of thing. And I remember seeing them, but the faces, I mean, I can remember to this, to this day exactly what they looked like and how they kind of wiggled around. And uh, it turns out within a few hours of waking up from coma, I was able to identify them all. But they, I had no idea who they were when I was in coma and first experienced them. Now, they were very important. Five of them were physically there when I was in the last 18 hours of my uh, coma experience before I started waking up. And that was very important because, in fact, that happened at the very far end of a journey that seemed to have gone on for months or even years. And yet it had to fit within seven Earth days. And, but that's important because later on when I was trying to explain all this, and my original default was this had to be some crazy brain effect, some wild hallucination or drug effect or dream. That's what I was trying to explain it as. But that's why the meningitis was such a gift. Is as we went deeper and deeper into it, trying to explain it, and I went over this with my doctors, went over all my scans and medical records, we came to realize, well, it seemed way too real to be real, as I described it to my older son, Evan IV, who was majoring in neuroscience at the time, when he came home from uh, school two days after I got out of the hospital, I told him it was way too real to be real, because it was. And to me, that meant it had to be a trick of the dying brain. But after many, many months and going over all this with my doctors and everything, we came to realize, well, it was way too real to be real because it really happened. But it didn't happen in my brain, and it didn't happen in the physical universe. It was a much deeper clue about the nature of all existence, and in many ways confirmed tens of thousands of other near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative experiences, not to mention the writings of religious mystics and prophets and those writing about the afterlife going back thousands of years, because we're all talking about the same thing. It's much more real than this world. Now, it turns out that those five faces, as I said, five of them were there uh, the last 18 hours I was in coma. That's important. There were also many people, family and friends, who were in the ICU room days before that that I don't remember at all. And also, uh, there was another face, uh, that of Susan Rentius, who was a friend of our families, who was never physically there. And the reason she's important, she wrote a book called Third Eye Open. Uh, she was a friend of our families, uh, uh, of my former wife in particular, going back for decades. And Susan channeled two people, and she had written a book about healing people, including a lot of people in coma. And uh, I remember my family had called Susan up and uh, solicited her help on the, the uh, fourth and fifth nights of my coma. And I remember her face as clearly as if she'd been there in the ICU room like the others, although she was never within about 150 miles of that ICU room. But when I was told that in the hours after I was waking up, as all of, of this was starting to come back to me and my earthly memories were starting to come back, and I was told, well, Susan was never here, but she channeled to you on nights four and five of coma, I thought, so what? Of course she did. I knew in that realm you don't go there physically anyway. But she was very real. Now, it turns out it was the sixth face, though, that really got my attention. In so many parts of this journey, uh, being amnesic for the life of Eben Alexander, not remembering a thing about this earth, this universe, about humanity, etc., it was a real gift. It allowed for a very far journey. It allowed me to be fearless. I had no attachments. I had no memory of any kind of responsibility to any other soul. In fact, for many parts of the journey, I thought, well, this can all continue, or it can cease to continue. It does not matter. And that's why the sixth face really got my attention. It was the face of a 10-year-old boy. Turns out, as I determined later on, it was the face of Bond, my 10-year-old son. That was Sunday morning. He had just been outside the room where they had the conference with the doctors telling my family, well, we're down to a 2% chance of survival. And best case scenario is he'll spend a few months in a coma, you know, get transferred to a nursing home, and then die. So why don't we just stop the antibiotics? They had tried to protect Bond from the worst news during this week, but he had stuck around outside the room during that discussion. He overheard that. He knew it was very bad news indeed. So he went running down the uh, hall of the ICU and came into my room. And there I was on my ventilator, 
and uh, with my eyes taped shut and being ventilated 12 times a minute as I had been for the last seven days. And he pulled open my eyelids. And what he saw was one eye looking up there, one eye down there, both pupils blown. Those of you in medicine know that's not a good thing. And I promise you, I didn't hear him with my ears and I didn't see him with my eyes. But it got through. And he was pleading with me, Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. And somehow that reached all the way through. I was deep in that realm of that misty murkiness with those six, where the six faces had materialized. His was the sixth. And it broke through. And believe me, it got my attention. And it was the most terrifying moment of the entire journey because I'd come to believe I had no responsibilities, no attachments. And now it was my love for him, even though I had no idea who this being was, but I knew that there was a very powerful, strong, loving connection that I had to come back. And it's the toughest thing I've ever done in all of my existence was to struggle my way back to this world. I remember at times thinking it was absolutely impossible. And yet, it was impossible not to. I had to come back because of my love for this other soul. And that's when I did start waking up and come back to this world. Now, of course, as I told you earlier, my doctors were right. My brain was wrecked. When I first came back, all I remembered was the journey I had been on. And I knew that very clearly, every bit of it. And I would, words and language came back very quickly, within hours, a day. And then childhood memories, that kind of thing, came back over a week or so. My, uh, two of my sisters would camp out on little cots beside me in the ICU and then the neuro step-down unit. Uh, and I didn't sleep at all. I was really nuts. I had a psychotic, delusional nightmare. I know what that looks like. That is nothing like that crisp, ultra-reality deep inside of coma. That was not a, a, a hallucination or a dream or a drug effect because my neocortex was far too wrecked to support such a thing. It was far more real, as I said, than anything that even my intact brain today could begin to muster. And therein lies the deep mystery that drove me to try and get a, uh, an understanding of this. Now, it turns out uh, that my childhood memories, as I said, came back over two weeks, three weeks after that. And then all of that knowing and experience of more than 20 years spent in academic neurosurgery returned to me over about eight weeks. In fact, what I came to realize over the next several years is that memories that came back to me were more complete by eight weeks out than they had been before my coma. That's a very mysterious and difficult thing to explain, and it only emerged that that was the case over several years after the coma. And that, therein lies a pretty deep clue about what's going on here. And it has to do with the very phenomenon of experience, consciousness, memory, and where all that really lives, and the reality of soul, spirit, consciousness that then generates all of what we see unfolding in the material realm. The reason that uh, so much of the medical community, as I said, is, has uh, taken my story uh, very seriously and often asked me to come give talks and presentations about consciousness has to do with the fact that meningitis is the most perfect model for human death. Uh, by destroying that outer neocortex, the surface of the brain, that's the part that modern neuroscience would tell you is very responsible for any of the detailed conscious experience that any of us have as human beings. Even though the phenomenon of consciousness has uh, parts of the deeper brain that fuel it, any of the detailed awareness of consciousness, everything we see and hear, everything we think, uh, all of our words and language, everything about everything you ever have experienced since before you were born, according to modern neuroscience, depends on at least some part of that neocortex, the most complex calculator in the brain, that some part of it needs to be around. And my doctors knew full well from my neurologic exams, from the lab tests, and especially from, uh, uh, really from my neurologic function and from the, the nature of my disease, but also from the scans that showed full thickness destruction of the neocortex uh, over all eight lobes of my brain. There was no way to explain this as a brain-based phenomenon, even though I tried to do that. And early on, I would tell my doctors something of what I experienced, and they would pat me on the back and say, oh, well, you were very, very sick. Your brain was soaking in pus. 
We have no idea how you've even come back to us. But all those memories, you can forget about it. The dying brain does all kinds of tricks. We tend to believe our doctors. I believe my doctors. So it was only many weeks later as I started getting into my medical records and discussing it with them, all those neurologic exams and the various scans, and we started realizing, well, where did this happen? How did this happen? I knew that it had not happened when I came out of coma or when I went into coma. The question was, when and how did it all happen? And that became a very deep mystery to me indeed and drove me uh, very much into uh, questioning everything I ever thought I had known about the nature of brain, mind, consciousness, and of all existence and reality. It turns out that this kind of disembodied consciousness or consciousness that's actually much richer when freed up from the shackles of the physical brain uh, gets us back to the mind-body discussion that, as I said earlier, has been going on for more than 26 centuries. And you can see the, the names there of some of the luminaries over time that have discussed this, Plato and Aristotle, of course, Rene Descartes, uh, and others. Um, but it's really something that uh, I had to question very deeply in trying to come to some kind of an understanding of this. Um, I, I, I know that I was driven deeply into what's called the hard problem of consciousness, uh, which is something I really didn't know uh, anything about before, even though I think the hard problem is one of the most vexing conundrum known, known to all of human thought. And it also got me deeply into uh, trying to investigate the very nature of the enigma of quantum mechanics. That's right at the core of this. As you get down and scratch the surface of physical reality and try and uncover how space, time, mass, energy work, what we reveal is that consciousness is at the very core of every bit of it. You cannot separate consciousness away and pretend that the observer is observing things and that the observations are independent of that observing mind. It's called the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. And uh, in fact, this is uh, one of my favorite quotes along those lines, Sir James Jeans, who was deeply into that mystery of the enigma of quantum mechanics. And he said this in the mid-1940s, the universe begins to look much more like a great thought than a great machine. Mind no longer appears to be an accidental intruder into the realm of matter. We ought rather to hail it as the creator and governor of this realm. And the mysteries of those experimental results in quantum mechanics have only gotten more and more bizarre. It's not as if modern physics understands it. Not as if they're smarter, although some of them will try and pretend that. That only shows they just don't get it. This is a far deeper mystery. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that you don't have to die or almost die to get this. In fact, by being a conscious being, the clues are deep within each and every one of us. And often it comes to us as what I call the gift of desperation. I'm sure there are many in this room who know exactly what that means. When a loved one has a terminal diagnosis or has died, or when we have a terminal diagnosis and are facing our mortality, often that's when we feel that touch and know and hear that voice of that all-loving deity that is right there to protect us and take care of us. But you can also get it through deep meditation and centering prayer. And it was about two years after my coma that I first started getting deeply into realizing that any kind of exploration of consciousness, and I realized I had to go deep within my own consciousness to even begin to glimpse some of the lessons that I, that I needed to learn to understand my journey. Um, and that's when I was exposed to uh, a discussion about uh, brain entrainment through sound, using differential uh, sound frequencies. Uh, and it's something I don't really have time to get into in any detail tonight. I talked about it briefly at the end of Proof of Heaven, especially in reference uh, to the work of Robert Monroe and uh, the Monroe Institute and some of what he did with brain entrainment. And since then, I've come to encounter Karen Newell, who was here on, on the front row, and she is uh, a business partner with uh, Kevin Cossey, and they together have developed Sacred Acoustics, which uh, really takes that kind of brain entrainment using differential sound frequencies to a whole new level. So any of you out there who want to learn more about that, I would encourage you to visit sacredacoustics.com and start learning. Um, I work with them on a, uh, a daily and nightly basis uh, in terms of trying to help evolve these meditative techniques and tools um, to help kind of the rest of us get deeply into meditation. 
Uh, I've gotten into a pattern where I, I would, I try to meditate two or three hours a day, although realistically, uh, if I can get an hour a day, I'm usually pretty lucky. And it's something that makes a tremendous difference as time goes on year after year in my knowing and understanding. I've revisited those realms of my journey. And in fact, not just revisiting memories, but revisiting the beings, the lessons, the spiritual power through using these, these tools of deep meditation with sacred acoustics. But it really is something one has to do as a lifelong commitment. It's not as if you can just kind of do this a few times and then say, well, it didn't really work for me. It's, uh, it's really something that's a lifelong commitment, but believe me, it's very much worth it. Uh, because inside of our consciousness is infinite knowing and capability and all of consciousness. In fact, the entire universe is a hologram and the mind is a hologram and in fact they are identical holograms and that is exactly what some of this meditative technique can enable any of us to get uh, deeply into so it's something I highly recommend now um, another thing that comes up uh, is I came to realize in the study of, of of my journey as I said the hard problem of consciousness which basically in its simplest form is that no neuroscientist on earth can give you the first sentence not even a sentence to explain how the physical brain might create consciousness. And it's not because we haven't done enough research. You know, the 1990s were the decade of the brain, and Obama has recently uh, earmarked a, a significant amount of federal funding to additional study the brain. The more we study the brain, as many brain scientists and those interested in philosophy of mind and the deepest aspects of neuroscience and of physics have come to realize, the more we realize it does not create consciousness. A better way to look at it is the brain is a reducing valve or filter. And that's an old idea. The filter theory uh, is, is one uh, name for that. Uh, in the late 19th century, the likes of, uh, of Carl Jung, uh, Frederick Meyer, Sir James Jeans, they were deeply into studying uh, human psyche and the mysteries of consciousness and the filter theory, um, and they realize that there are many facets of human personality that do not end with bodily death. And they knew the power of reincarnation. They had the evidence of it. And it turns out all of that got sidetracked in 1905. And that had to do with the Annus Mirabile of Albert Einstein. That's basically his four papers that year are what kicked off the heyday of scientific materialism of the 20th century. But the good news is the paper that actually also kicked off the whole field of quantum mechanics, his paper on the photoelectron effect, that's what gave him the Nobel Prize, uh, also sowed the seeds for the undoing of that pure materialism. And that's all coming together now as modern students of consciousness, those who study the deep mysteries of mind, of the very nature of existence, of the physics, of the quantum world, and in trying to put that together with a deeper understanding of space, time, and causality, how everything really works, are coming to realize that consciousness is at the very core of it all. And I often, as those who have read the book Proof of Heaven will realize, I often quote uh, Albert Einstein because I think he's a very brilliant physicist. Um, but I'd like to start getting into the, the end part of this talk by uh, quoting Nikola Tesla. The day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, by that the phenomena of consciousness, soul, spirit, it will make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of its existence. Tesla was a brilliant scientist, and he was absolutely right. I believe we are getting deeply into his prophetic uh, decade, even as we speak. Now, it turns out that as I was wrestling with all of this in the months after my coma, trying to explain this, how in the world could consciousness be so greatly enhanced, um, I ended up, my older son, as I told you earlier, when he came home that second day out of the hospital, and he stood there looking at me, I was 16 pounds lighter than I'd been. I had a, an IV and I was still getting uh, antibiotics at home. But he took one look at me and when I told him it was way too real to be real, he looked at me and he was shocked because he could see there was a light shining within me, that I'd been completely transformed, that I was far more present than I had ever been before. And he really couldn't understand it. But he was the one who advised me, if you want this to be of any value to anyone, because my goal at that time was to write it up as a neuroscientific report. 
because I knew from what my doctors had told me that there was something wrong with the model of brain, mind, and consciousness because the meningitis should have disabled any experience and yet I'd had this incredibly profound experience. Now, he was the one who told me, well, if you want this to be of any value, you've got to write down your whole experience before you read anything about near-death experiences or about physics or cosmology. That was the last thing I want, wanted anybody to tell me. I wanted to dive deeply into everything I could read about near-death experiences. I was completely blown away by what had happened to me. I wanted to learn everything I could about what others had been through. And the more I, I he, he advised me to write down everything, which I did. I wrote 20,000 words in my entire coma experience before I finally dove into the near-death experience literature. And as I did, I was absolutely shocked. I came to realize that tens of thousands of reports are out there. And in fact, by extension, hundreds of millions have been to this very same realm. And in fact, the near-death experience literature started growing largely out of the 1960s when medical science came up with ways to uh, bring back cardiac arrest patients. Uh, and that's what has populated this world with millions of souls who have been to the other side and come back to tell the tale. That is not an accident. That is all happening for a purpose. Now, in fact, the more I read about the near-death literature, I then got into the afterlife literature going back thousands of years, including the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, Greek writings on, uh, on the afterlife. And I came to realize that and the, and the writings of religious mystics and prophets, that they're all talking about the same thing. Skeptics kind of bang their head against the forest, uh, you know, in the trees and miss the forest of the reality of that realm. More than half of people who report on near-death experiences talk about the ultra-reality of that realm. It changes their lives. Another interesting thing is the memories do not fade. Often after I give a talk like this, I'll have people come up to me, uh, including people who may have had a profound near-death experience that they remember very vividly, even though it occurred in the 1920s, 1930s. They remember it to this day. These memories don't fade. They are not brain-based memories. They are not hallucinations, drug effect, dream states. This is reality. It's at the core of who we are and what's going on. Now, I started encountering deeper mysteries about my own journey. As I told you, I was amnesic for Evan Alexander's life before coma as I went through all this. And that part is quite atypical for a near-death experience. And of course, I originally attributed that to the severe meningitis, destruction of my neocortex. To me, that explained why I didn't remember my life. I know now the explanation goes far deeper than that. But it turns out that months after my coma, I was really wrestling with things as I read more and more near-death experiences. One is, if I had scripted this, first and foremost, my father would have been there. He had passed over four years before my coma. This is the father I mentioned to you earlier, combat surgeon in the Second World War, uh, who was a tremendous influence on me, a scientist uh, and a very strong religious and spiritual influence. And yet, he was nowhere to be found. And similarly, in my, in my view, as I read more and more of this, uh, was the, um, the deep mystery on that butterfly wing, that beautiful girl. I'll never forget how she was dressed, how she was sitting, how she looked at me, the way her thoughts came in, you're deeply loved and cherished, all those wonderful messages of unconditional love. I remember her face so perfectly that when I came back, I realized I'd never met her in my life. That was a really deep mystery. And to me, the more I read about near-death experiences, the more I realized how the similarities far outweigh the differences, how my experience very much validated tens of thousands of reports out there of other near-death experiences and of the afterlife literature and of prophets and mystics in their writings going back thousands of years. And yet, who in the world was this beautiful girl? And, and I was really shocked because I knew I'd been on a profound, very real spiritual journey. Yet why these strange curveballs that my father wasn't there and this beautiful girl who I'd never met? And to answer that question, uh, of the shock that hit me. This is the spoiler alert, because this is pretty much how the book kind of comes together. Um, 
turns out that four months after my coma, I got an answer to all this. And to give you that answer, I have to go back a little bit and give you more of my personal history. Part of my story that was absolutely essential and that for much of my life was something that didn't make much sense to me is the fact that I was adopted. My birth mother was a sophomore in high school. My birth father was a senior in high school. And there was really no way for them to get together. And as my birth mother found out to her, her chagrin over several months, as much as she wanted to keep me, her own father was unemployed. He couldn't hold a job. She had two younger sisters at home. As a 10th grader, there was no way for her to bring a baby into that house. North Carolina had very strict laws uh, and about, um, about adoption and all that. And, and so, in fact, she, by four months out, figured that she had to put me up for adoption. Uh, the handwriting was on the wall. So she had to let me go. Now, it turns out that, like many adoptees, I would wonder about my birth family, and I would sometimes write letters to the children's home as I was growing up, uh, wondering, is there any sign of my birth mother out there? And those strict North Carolina laws were there to prevent any kind of reunion. In fact, I heard of examples where birth dates were changed just to make it more difficult for anyone to find their origins. And um, turns out I couldn't have been more fortunate. I was adopted into a very loving family that honored all my hopes and dreams, and I couldn't have been luckier. So I'd let it go. I'd learned, okay, people made agreements back in 1954, and they were just living by those agreements, and that's fine. I, I, I let it go. Turns out, um, as so many things in, in our lives, there are those things that make no sense for the longest time until we look back and see how maybe it was all part of a much deeper lesson, especially some of those hardships and difficulties. Um, and likewise, there are some events that seem very trivial when they first happen and yet they have tremendous magnitude. One of those events has to do with the fact that my older son, Evan IV, I've already told you about him, he was the one majoring in neuroscience uh, in college when I was in coma. Uh, well, in the year 2000, he'd been in sixth grade, and he came home with a school project, and that was on family uh, genealogy. And I remember he came to me and told me about that project, and I told him a few stories about our adoptive family history, and he said, Dad, you just don't get it. This is about your biological heritage. We need to more, know more about your adoptive family, um, about your birth family. And uh, I remember just thinking, okay, gosh, I'll humor him. And so I wrote another letter to the, uh, uh -oh, to, uh, uh, another letter to the children's home um, in the year 2000. And I remember it was a Friday afternoon in, uh, during a blizzard. I was taking Eben. We lived in Boston. I was working at Harvard Medical School at the time. And I was driving Eben up to Maine to go skiing. And uh, I remember thinking, oh, yeah, Betty, the social worker, said if I call her today, maybe she'd have an answer. I fully expected to get the same answer I'd always gotten. You know, no, your birth mother's not out there. Forget about it. I called her up. And she said, why, yes, I, I did find something out. Are you sitting down? Well, I was driving through a blizzard, but I was sitting down. Your birth parents got married. I cannot tell you what a shock that was. Never had that thought crossed my mind that they might have got, gotten together. And Betty said, there's more, at which point I did pull over to the side of the road. And she said, they had three children, but your youngest sister died two years ago. That would have been in 1998. And they're still grieving her loss. So it's not a good time to come back in their lives. That was that trauma I told you about in February 2000 that sent me into eight years of pure agnosticism. I didn't recognize what a hit that perceived rejection was at that time. It was only months later when people started pointing out to me that I'd stopped taking my two sons to church. I stopped saying prayers with them at night. And I came to realize that the biggest casualty of that perceived rejection was it wiped out any last hope that there was a loving personal God or any power to prayer. And that was gone from my life for eight years. I promise you my coma journey changed all of that forever. Well, it turns out that seven years after that, in, in the summer of 2007, walking on a beach in South Carolina with two of my sisters, they said, well, don't you think it's about time you reached out to your birth family again? My first thought, no, because I recognized at that time how that perceived rejection in February 2000 had really kicked me over the cliff. 
My whole life had started to spiral downhill, and it took me a long time to figure out what had happened and to try and reverse that, uh, reverse that flow and come back to this, uh, you know, into e existence and, and be there for my family and friends. But it turns out um, that they were right, and it was time. So I wrote another letter. This was in summer 2007 to the children's home. And this time got a very positive answer. Yes, we'd love to meet you. Uh, all of this is d described in, in detail in the book Proof of Heaven, so you can get a lot more background there. Uh, and it's a beautiful story, a wonderful reunion. Turns out October 5th, 2007, I walked down a sidewalk in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and for the first time in 54 years, I was with my birth parents. And it was the most beautiful reunion. I cannot put in words. That old saying, walking on air, is exactly how I felt. And if you'd asked me soon thereafter, how long did it take you to walk down that short sidewalk to their front door? 10 seconds or 10 minutes? I couldn't have told you. I was so completely blown away. And then meeting them and reconnecting after all those years apart, a beautiful story. The next day, I met my birth sister and brother. And in the coming months, met aunts and uncles, a lot of extended family. They got to know my adoptive family. And it's been a beautiful, beautiful reunion. But always a little bittersweet at the core because they didn't really talk about Betsy, you know, that beautiful sister who had passed over two years before I even knew about her existence. And to me, uh, you know, it was still a gaping wound for them. Lots of, lots of pain around her loss when she was 36 years old. And I wanted to know so much more, but uh, that was very hard to come by because they weren't very comfortable talking about it and sharing. But I do remember my birth sister, Kathy, promised to someday send me a picture of Betsy. And she did. That picture arrived four months after my coma. And I remember pulling it out of the envelope, and she had emblazoned this poem across the picture. And it's a beautiful poem. The poem is in the book Proof of Heaven. It was written by David Germano, uh, Romano. And it's, uh, it's called When Tomorrow Starts Without Me. And I remember I started reading that poem, and tears started filling my eyes. And I was just overcome with this incredible grief and emotion over the tragedy, just collapsing on the floor, just this horrible tragedy of losing this beautiful sister long before I ever even knew of her existence. And I remember putting that picture up on the dresser, and the next morning I was in that room reading uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book, uh, Life After Death. She has a beautiful story in there of a 13-year-old girl who has a profound near-death experience, is in coma, and, um, and she encounters her brother, and he serves that same function that the beautiful girl on the butterfly wing served for me, bringing that message of unconditional love, and he helped her to come back to this world. And as she came back and she was explaining it all to her father, and she said, but I don't understand. I don't have a brother. And he said, well, you did have a brother, but he died three months before you were born, so we never told you about him. And that's when I looked up on my dresser, and I recognized that picture of my birth sister, the beautiful girl on the butterfly wing. And it's almost like she was looking at me as if to say, do you finally get it? And it was taken three weeks before she left this physical world. And it's exactly how she looked at me on that butterfly wing. And I cannot tell you how powerful. That changed everything forever. And I'd like to close by just reminding you of that beautiful message that she gave me that really is a message for each and every one of us because we are one soul. We are one soul consciousness. This is all about all of us and all of this world, and it's time to get together and overcome those false boundaries of separation. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. You will be taken care of. You have nothing to fear. Thank you very much.